What could God do through a group of spirit-empowered people who are connected by their shared experience with God and united in their mission? What, what could God do? Well, we've been given a little glimpse of what he could do in the book of Acts in the Bible. And today, we are starting a new series called Great Beginnings. And we're, we're looking at the beginning of the church. And when you, when you look at the beginning of the church, what you don't see is a planning session. You see a couple things. You see prayer, and you see power. And that's how the church began. And I believe that that's what God wants for us today as the church. Not just our congregation, but the church, capital C, the church, people around the world who have put their faith in Jesus Christ. So Great Beginnings is a look at how the church began, how God works through the church, and I believe it's going to give you a fresh revelation of what God wants to do right now. And I feel like we're in sort of a similar situation as the early church because we've just had a season of prayer. And it was out of that season of prayer that God's power and presence came. And and I mean his presence, (laughs) where where he was there doing stuff by his spirit. But this this, this, um, series is good for another reason. Great beginnings is appropriate for our church, our congregation, who we are and where we are in the timeline of God's work in and through us. It is a time of great beginnings for us. I'll I'll talk about that a little bit today, but even more on Vision Sunday on March 6th. I'm so excited for that day, for that service, because God is doing a new thing in our church. It is a time of new beginnings. And so today, I want to look at one of the most powerful uh, verses, uh, sections of Scripture that really describe what God has done and is doing in your lives individually, but also what He's doing in our church. And I'm calling this message today, Hope and Life. Hope and Life. Would you turn in your Bible to Titus chapter 3, verses 3 to 8? And I don't think I can remember a time I have preached out of the book of Titus. I I really feel like God just led me to this passage. Titus is written, it was a letter written by Paul, one of the early church leaders, to Titus, a pastor. And everybody was a new pastor (laughs) in in those days, in the the beginnings of the church, the first decades of the church. And uh, this was uh, someone that Paul was mentoring, and he was, he was trying to help Titus know how to build solid Christians and, and establish solid, thriving churches. And so this is a letter that we can learn, again, what God wants for the church and what God wants for you. So I'm not going to get into the book of Acts today. That's going to come in in the weeks uh, ahead. But I really wanted to just bring a unique message today. So Titus chapter 3, starting in verse 3. Paul writes and he says, Once we, and he's talking about the church once all of us in, that are gathered here today, once all of us around the world who are following Jesus, once we too were foolish and disobedient. Now in the Bible, especially we see it in the book of Proverbs in the Old Testament, but, but foolishness doesn't mean you made some bad choices. You bought a lemon car. That, that's not what he's, that, when he says foolishness, it implies moral foolishness. In the Old Testament, it says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. That is foolishness. Once we too were foolish and disobedient to God. We were misled and became slaves to many lusts and pleasures. So he's talking about, man, when we were far from God, our, our internal person was a mess. 
We were enslaved. Actually, we were in chains to many lusts and pleasures. And he goes on and says, our lives were full of evil. And that word evil, it's from the, the root word that means malice. It is evil towards another person. It's not just evil like I, I thought a bad thought. It is thinking bad thoughts or doing bad things towards another person. So he said, our lives were full of evil, m- malice, and envy. Envy is when you see someone that has an advantage that you want, and you want to take it from them. You, you don't want them to get ahead. You want you to get ahead. That is envy. And he said, we hated each other. Okay, now this is, this is a pretty bleak picture of humanity, away from God. And you might think, well, that's so extreme. But just for a moment, would you look around? Look around our city? Look around our country? Look around our world? And do you not see that this is exactly right? This is a picture. This is is actually a picture of humanity far from God. And Paul starts there. And for me, these verses that I just read, they are like a black velvet cloth or a dark blue velvet cloth with diamonds in front of it. And those diamonds show up even more when you see the context and the backdrop. And Paul says, this is what we were like. We were hateful. We wanted to get ahead at at, at the expense of another person. But, somebody say, but, but, but. and so often in the Bible, that is such an important little word, but when God, our Savior, revealed his kindness and love, he saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. Have you ever stopped to think how many times it says in the New Testament, you're saved by God's grace. You're saved by God's grace. It's not by what you've done. Why do you think it says that over and over and over again? It's such an important message. And we so often think of it, uh, uh, we, we so often misunderstand what salvation is and who it comes from. It comes from God. And it is because of his kindness and love. He goes on and says, he washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. Now, a lot of times when we think of birth, we think of a, just a physical birth where there was a, a, there's a person that was not previously in the world that was born and now is in the world. And so we, t- we tend to go to birth, but that's not what it says. It says new birth. That is talking about something that existed that was dead that got born again. Yeah. And that, that is the phrase. It is regeneration, re New birth. It is a complete change in your life to what it should be. When you have put your faith in Jesus Christ and his Holy Spirit has come into your life, you are born again. You are regenerated. Not as if there's, uh, like you weren't there before and now you are. It's that you were there before, but you were spiritually dead. And now you're spiritually alive. You are reborn on the inside. And he says, a new, he's washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and new life. It is a renewed life. That is reestablishing something in a like new condition or a better than new condition, an improved condition. That is what this phrase means. It means renewal. And this is a work of the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit who makes you come alive on the inside. When you put your faith in Jesus, it's he that renews you. It's he that makes you born again. Verse 6, God generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And I believe that he's gone on uh, even a step further. And he's not just talking about new life and new birth anymore, but he's gone beyond that and said, God has actually poured out his spirit. We read it in one of the verses we read it in our Bible reading plan right at the end of the fast in Joel chapter two, where he says, God says, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. 
And he, he's talking here about being baptized in the Holy Spirit. When you put your faith in Jesus, his Holy Spirit comes to live inside you. But the Holy Spirit, come, he wants to come again into your life and baptize you, immerse you, fill you to overflowing with power for life and service and following Jesus. And power for witnessing, sharing Jesus with the people around you. And Paul is just talking about, I remember how we were. We were hateful and we were lustful and we were a mess on the inside and a mess on the outside. But God came and he gave us salvation and he gave us new birth and he renewed us. And then he poured out his Holy Spirit in us. Verse 7, because of his grace, he made us right in his sight and he gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. Some of the other translations of the Bible say that last phrase this way, the hope of eternal life. That's what God gives us, hope and life. Hope of eternal life. It's the hope that we're going to receive eternal life. It's the hope that comes from eternal life that has already begun in you and in me by the work of the Holy Spirit. That word uh, translated confidence in the NLT that we usually read from, but hope in the other translations, it means both. It is a confident hope. It is a confident belief and trust that God's good is going to come into your life. It's not hope like, oh, I hope something good happens today. I hope I find a dollar on, this, on the sidewalk. I hope. It's not that kind of hope. It is like, I'm looking ahead. I, I'm, I'm hoping in faith and trust and confidence because of who my confidence is in. It's in God. So my hope is not just I hope something good happens. My hope is a hope. Something good is happening. I just don't know when. Does that make sense? It's confident hope. And what is that hope when he said hope of eternal life? There are a couple of root words that are translated life in the Bible. This is not the biology life. This is not like life, physical life versus death. And in fact, if, if you got a promise, depending on how your life is going or where you live in the world or what is happening, if you got a promise that your physical life is going to go on forever, that might not be a good promise. That might be like, oh, I don't want that because my life is bad. This is a different life it's talking about. It is the kind of, it is the interior quality of life that he's talking about, eternal life that God has promised us. It is enthusiasm, exuberance, vitality, uh, and uh, hopefulness, uh, belief, trust. It is that kind of life. It is the kind of life that God gives you and me on the inside. That eternal life starts now and goes forever. And that is our confident hope. Our hope is in life. And that life comes from God. Amen. Now and eternally. Praise his name. Then at, at, so that's, that's, that's such a powerful uh, group of verses, verses four through seven. It really states what God has given us, his hope and life that he has given us and the regeneration that happens in our, uh, on the inside and in our lives. But then in verse eight, Paul tips his hand and he tells Pastor Titus why this is so important that this be proclaimed. And it's why I'm proclaiming this to you and me today. He says in verse 8, this is a trustworthy saying. And I want you to insist on these teachings so that, somebody say so that. So that, so that all who trust in God will devote themselves to doing good. So he says, we got to remind ourselves of what God has done in us, what he has accomplished in us, so that all who trust in God will devote themselves to doing good. Now, again, this word is a little bit bigger than just simply doing a little good deed. It is, this, this word good, it implies moral excellence. So he, he's saying that, if you have all this stuff happen to you, you have a new birth, you have renewal, the Holy Spirit does that work in you, and then God pours out his Holy Spirit, and your life is immersed in the Holy Spirit, all of that is going to work its way out on the outside in a life lived for God, a life of moral excellence. 
So there's, there's three things that I really want to apply to you from this passage. And uh, there are three things that God gives you and that he gives me. The first one is that God gives you a new beginning. God gives you a new beginning. We, we, we have been talking about how it is a fresh start. It is actually being born again, being renewed, improved, made how your life was supposed to be in God's mind. He washed away our sins and gave us new life and new birth, renewal. The Holy Spirit begins a radical transformation in you at salvation. We call it conversion because you're actually changing. You're being converted. You're, you're, you're being made into a hot rod and you were a VW or you were a Chevy Equinox like I drive and he's making you into a dragster. He's pumping up your engine. And this was promised in the Old Testament. In Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 26 to 27, God foretold this. And he said, and I will give you a new heart. And I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. And I will put my spirit in you so that you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey my regulations. It's amazing. God's standards are very high, but his love is so great that he says, I'm going to give you my spirit. I'm going to put a new spirit. I'm going to renew your spirit. And I'm going to actually even put in you the desire to live for me and to follow me. And, and you will be new this is pretty radical for the Old Testament, but we've seen the fulfillment in the New Testament and in our lives. Sometimes we think that salvation is something we do. But God said, I will put my spirit in you. I will make you new. Sometimes we think salvation is like when a parent sees a messy room with his toddler or her toddler and there are toys everywhere. And we're grandparents, and this looks like our playroom. This, this really does, once the kids have their way with it. And there's just toys everywhere. And the parents, we, we sometimes think that salvation is like when the parent says, okay, little Susie, okay, little Johnny, you got to pick up all those toys knowing inside they're not going to get it all done. It's so sweet, but we just want to see them try their very best. And we know that a little bit later when they go down for a nap, we're going to pick them all up. We're going to complete the job, but we want them to do part of the job. And when the parent asks that, I want to show you a picture of what the parent imagines the child will do. <laughs> that child is, I mean, it's just spick and span. The child is vacuum dusted, cleaned all the baseboards. Oh, yeah, sprayed air freshener. The child just does it. But what does the child actually do? Show, show you. That's how the child does it when you say, please clean up the toys. They go get another bin and start dumping them out also. But I use this as a negative illustration because salvation is not like that. Salvation is not God looking down on sinful humanity and saying, okay, I want you to clean up as many of your sins as you can. I want you to change as many of your habits as you can. I want you to cut out 50% of your swear words. I, I want you to start cleaning up your life. And okay, if you kind of run out, I'll swoop in there. I'll do the rest. That is not salvation. Amen. Salvation is provided only by God. Amen. It is his grace that saves you. It is not your work that saves you. Now, once God has come into your life and he has saved you, then you begin to follow him and you, you definitely have some effort to put in, but that does not save you. In fact, in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, it says, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And here it is, another New Testament passage where he's just reminding us, hey, it's not by your works. And you cannot take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. 
so none of us can boast about it. Salvation comes when you put your faith in God and by his grace, he saves you. That is salvation. It all comes from God. It all depends on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. It does not depend on your good works. Now, saved people begin to follow Jesus. And that's why every Sunday when I, when I invite you to put your faith in Jesus, I end with saying, and I'm going to let you lead. So that means my choices are going to begin to look different because they honor and reflect Jesus. Okay, so God gives you a new beginning. The next couple of things that he does, much shorter. Number two, God gives you a new status with him. God gives you a new status with him. In the, in the NLT the translation that I read today, it says in verse 7, because of his grace, he made us right in his sight. Other translations say you have been justified. And this is legal language. It's as if you are, are in, a, a, you're, you're the defendant in court on trial for theft. So someone has accused you of stealing something from work. And in the courtroom, Man, everyone presents their two sides and their explanations and their alibis and everything, but it kind of all rests on the jury there at the end. What is their decision going to be? And you know as the defendant, wow, I hope this goes in my favor because if not, if I am, if I am found guilty of this crime, it is going to make getting work harder in the future. Uh, it's going to damage trust in my friendships and my family. I mean, there's all kinds of bad stuff that's going to come on my life if I am found guilty in this courtroom but then when the jury comes out everyone's holding their breath what it, what's what's the verdict going to be and they say not guilty if the jury says you're not guilty you are not guilty no. it does not go on your record trust is not broken it, it, it's uh, there's reasonable doubt that you did not do it and so you get to walk free. You have all the same rights. You are free. You're not going back to jail. You're not, you're not paying fines. You're not paying the penalty for that crime. You're not having to make restitution for that crime. You are free. Your slate is wiped clean. And in 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says this, For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, because we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. So because of Jesus, you are declared not guilty. You are free. You are free from your past. You are free from that sin. You are free from shame. You are free from the eternal consequences. Sometimes on earth, if you've done something and then God has forgiven you, you're not going to go to hell for it, but you may have to pay. You may have to pay for that in the earthly courts. But in the eternal courts, in the heavenly courts, slate is clean. And God begins to look at you through the blood of Jesus Christ as a filter for your life. So God gives you a new status with him. And finally, God gives you a new future. God gives you a new future. He, he gave us confidence. He gave us hope of eternal life, the hope of eternal life. So you've gone from a broken relationship with God to connection with God. You've, got, you've gone from a life heading to hell, which is all sinners are heading to hell. I was heading to hell. You were heading to hell. Before we put our faith in Jesus, we're no longer heading there. Now we're heading to heaven. You actually have a new future in Jesus Christ. You have the hope of eternal life, and all of this transformation in you will work itself out in a life lived for God. So the bottom line of this message is your hope of eternal life inspires you to do good things. Your hope of eternal life inspires you to do good things. So what do we got to do as our action step? All of our salvation rests on Jesus. There's nothing we can do to save ourselves. We cannot be holy enough to save ourselves. But now that we're, we're, we've put our faith in Jesus, we can begin to follow him. So I, I just want to challenge you. Renew your mind to who you are in Christ and act accordingly. Just that simple. Renew your mind to who you are in Christ and act like it. Act like it in your choices. Act like it in your faith. Act like it in your service to God. Act like it in your giving. Act like it. Act accordingly to what God has done on the inside of you. 
One way to renew your mind is to come and be a part of Living Free. I am so pumped. I get to share a little bit tonight. We're, you know, doing, taking different segments and different things. Oh my goodness, tonight we're going to talk about spiritual transactions and we're going to talk about getting new, getting freed up and tearing down strongholds. It is going to be so good. I, I want every one of you to get this material. It is so good. And we're going to renew our minds and we're going to be, begin to see strongholds in your life and in my life torn down and broken for good, demolished. Yeah. We're believing for that. Yeah. Romans 12, 2 says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Now today, I'm just going to be honest with you. We, we have let ourselves flow in the Holy Spirit. We have. Oh, yeah. we, we have just, we've bumped over all our little time guidelines and everything else. But I tell you what, I don't know if you are feeling this. I feel like God is here. God is here. And we've taken the, the time, we've invested the time in his presence. I got two more things to do today. I want to pray for you and then I want to tell you something exciting about our church, okay? So first of all, I'm going to ask you to stand. And in a, after praying, I'm going to let you be seated again. So I'm not done. Don't leave. Online, don't leave. I'm not done. You might miss out on the announcement, okay? So be sure you stay behind. Let's pray. Would you bow your heads? Lord, do you want me to say that? If you are here and you know you have put your faith in Jesus, you've prayed that prayer, but honestly, your life does not look anything different than your coworkers, than all the people in the world. You got the same stuff inside of you. You got the same stuff flowing out of you. If you've said that prayer, but it doesn't feel like you're new, there, there's, there, there are a couple reasons I could imagine. One, you weren't truly converted, but I'm guessing you probably were. Another one is that the enemy comes to deceive. Yes. And he, from the, from the moment you put your faith in Jesus, has, be, has said to you, you're not changed. You're not new. Nothing's different. You're still going to go have those same habits. You're still going to have that same depression. You're, and he is a deceiver. And he is a liar. Yes, he is. So that, that's another potential reason. And I, I don't know if that's you this morning. You feel like, man, I feel like I'm not new. I feel like I need renewal spiritually. Maybe it's one of those reasons I just said, or maybe it's something else. I don't know. But would you just raise your hand? And I just want to pray for you a faith-filled prayer. Yeah, hands going up. Thank you for your honesty. God can work with honesty. He can work with honesty. Okay, Lord, you see our hands raised right now. This is an important moment Lord, we want to be new. We don't want to just say we're a Christian. We want to be a Christian. And, and we don't want to just be a Christian. We want to be a thriving Christian. So I pray, Holy Spirit, come into every life right now, Lord God, and, and make this scripture true in our lives, in our experience. Lord God, come and renew. Excuse me, if the person was never regenerated to, the be to begin with, regenerate them now, Holy Spirit. Make them new. Give them, make them born again now. Yes. Holy Spirit. Move. Renew us now, Holy Spirit. Move. That we would be new on the inside and it would show on the outside. And Lord, for every one of us in this prayer right now, for every one of us, I pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on us. Pour out your Spirit on us. Pour out your Spirit on us. We want more. We want more of your spirit, more of your glory, more of your presence, more of your power to work in our lives that we would devote ourselves to morally excellent good things. In Jesus' name, with your head still bowed, I, I want to invite you to put your faith in Christ. If you've never done that, 
So I was just praying for people that, just like me, we've, 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 we've said their prayer before. But if you've never put your faith in Jesus, whether you're online, in the room, it doesn't matter. Now is your time. The Holy Spirit is here. He is ready to regenerate you. He is ready to make you new. If you want to be saved, would you shoot your hand up right now? Raise your hand and I'll just pray for you. Online, you can raise your hand to God and he will see you. Lord, you see every person making a decision to follow Jesus right now. Come into our lives. Would you repeat after me? Jesus, I acknowledge I'm a sinner and I need a savior. Please forgive me of my sin and make me new. I choose to follow you and let you lead in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God. Woo! There are some people who are going to look back on this Celebration Sunday 2022 as the day it all changed for you going forward. Go ahead and have a seat. If you just prayed that prayer for salvation, whether you rededicated your life to Jesus or you made a new decision, would you take the Connect card? Listen, I really mean this. I need you to do this. Take the Connect card. Fill out enough info that I can at least send you an encouraging email and check the box at the bottom so I know what decision you made today. All right, this is big. We believe that God has given our church a new name. We have been praying for this for a couple of years through a couple of different prayer and fasting cycles. We have brainstormed. We have talked. We have um, workshopped it. We, we, have, we have been thinking about it, praying about it for a long time. And we believe that God has given us a new name. You ready? Hope and Life Church. Hope and Life Church. We, we are so excited about this because we see right now God is breathing new life into her, our church. He is. He is doing it. We can see it. Uh, I, I'm so pumped just to be in our new location. We, we prayed for many years, and God opened this door. And so when, you know, when you're praying and you're saying, God, show me your will. Uh, like, for example, show me, show me to whom to marry, Lord. Show me. I, I'm trying to figure it out. Help me. I, I get advice. I look at your word. Help, help me. And then you get married. Once you're married, you no longer say or pray, is this the right spouse? Now you say, thank you, Lord. You gave me the spouse. Help me work it out. And in the same way, we prayed and prayed. We actually had another location in mind, and God just absolutely closed that door, and he opened this door. So now I really rejoice in this location, even for reasons I can't even see, because I know God opened this door. This is where he wanted us. This location is special to God, and we have a special purpose for being here. We are light in a dark place. I am very excited about just a new group of people. If you're newer, you just think, well, this is just the group of people. But I've been here 12 years. So to me, this is a new group of people. This is uh, people who have been with us for years who are renewed and actually new people. Uh, I'm so excited about you who are here. Last Sunday online, we had 50 households on Sunday, just on that day, <laughs> tuning into our broadcast, to our live stream. So we are actually about double, last Sunday, what you see in the room. Or, or even more, I don't know how many is in a household. A household could be one person with a device, or it could be two or three sitting around a smart TV. So God has brought new people together. And I'll talk more about that on, on Vision Sunday. We are becoming a passionate house of prayer and I see that in, in who we are, in our, our 21 days of prayer and fasting, but also in just how we pray in our services and how we're praying for one another, how we're seeing God move. We are becoming a passionate house of prayer. We are on the verge, and I know you probably think, well, I've said this so many times, but we're this close from being able to start our remodel. And I'm so, I'm so excited about that because that is going to breathe even new life into our new facility. And we're, we're, uh, I'll talk more about it on Vision Sunday, but we're going to get a youth chapel and a kids chapel and everything's going to be revitalized and we're, it's going to be awesome. Yes. I can't wait. 
So we have lots of hope for our future. And God is breathing in new life now. Hope and life. But there's more. We have hope and life to offer our community to the people around us. And not just right now, but in the decades to come should Jesus delay, delay his second coming. We have hope in life. That is what we have to give. It is not hope in us. It is not life in us. It is hope and life in Jesus Christ. And that is what we have to offer. And just think about the age we live in. It's an age of death. It's an age of disease. It's an age of division. It's a, an age of tension and fear. Uh, I, I rented a, uh, a U-Haul uh, just for a couple of hours to move something heavy this weekend. And the owner of that establishment was racked in fear. He yelled at me. And he was just in a rage about things that have been happening on his property. It, that, is, that, is, that is the day we live, on, live in. But we have hope and life, to speak into situations like that. That's what we have to offer our community. There is hope in Jesus. There is eternal life in Jesus. And that's why I believe God is calling us with a new name, Hope and Life Church. Now, uh, we could just start with the name, but that's not what we're going to do. <laughs> We actually want to change our constitution that says our name shall be Northwest Family Church of the Assemblies of God of Auburn, Washington. We want to change that with our new name. And that requires a vote of voting members. So on Vision Sunday, uh, in the annual meeting right after church, we're going to be voting on the name and a couple other little constitution and bylaws changes. I'd like to give you an opportunity to know about all that ahead of time. So in two weeks from today, on February 13, we're going to do a little roundtable Q&A session right after church. Anyone is welcome. Uh, but I would encourage all members to be there because you're going to be asked to vote on it a couple weeks later. All right? So it will be a time to answer your questions, to talk about the process, just to, just to prepare well. So that on the day of, it's not a, we don't need to ask a lot of informational questions because we've already asked those. So I would encourage you to be there on February 13th and ask your questions there. One last time. Oh, my goodness. Longest service ever. Would you stand to your feet? It's so funny because this is about what our services used to be <laughs> back before the pandemic. But would you join me in praying for our church? Just let's just pray every blessing you can think of for our church. Would you lift your voices out loud in this room and out loud wherever you are online? And then I'll wrap us up. So I'm going to be quiet for a moment. The church is going to pray. Church, would you pray a blessing on our church? Go. Lord. Every blessing, blessing in our church. Lord, I thank you for the hope and life you've given each of us as an individual. I thank you for the hope and life you've given us as a church. We have hope for the future. In the midst of a pandemic and worldwide global crises, crises you have given us hope and life. And not even what's going on in this world can take that from us. Our hope and our life is in you, Jesus. And we're so grateful. Lord, I pray your blessing on our church. I know that if you delay the rapture when you come back to, to see your, to gather your church, you meet us in the clouds. If you delay that, this church is going to go on vibrantly, healthily for decades to come, even beyond me, even beyond my lifetime. Thank you, Jesus. And I pray for the blessing of longevity on this church. I pray, Lord, for the blessing of multiplication on this church. Lord God, that we would grow in numbers of people people coming out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light. Lord, I pray for the blessing of healing on this church. I pray for the ministry of deliverance on this church. Lord, I pray that this would be a place where people are saved, baptized in the Holy Spirit, renewed, revived, and living free. Lord, I pray that would be the story of our church going forward. And that story only happens because of your power, the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we invite you in greater ways, come in us, move through through us, speak to us, speak through us. Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we give a big old shout of praise? Woo! 
All right, Hope in Life, yeah! Praise the Lord. Oh, guys, I'm so excited for this new chapter, this new beginning that the Lord is bringing us to. It's going to be so cool, and we're all in it together because we're better together. Amen? Amen. All right, well, speaking of being better together, if you were new or if you checked that, re- if you um, accepted Jesus as your first Uh, as your savior for the first time today, please let us know. We want to walk with you. Grab that connect card, fill it out, put it in the box, and we will reach out to you. If you joined us online, so glad you were here too. Make sure you hit subscribe so more people can find out about Jesus. That's what it's for. And um, also, remember, right after service is what? S'mores and more. Don't forget about the more. I'm still not sure what the more is, but I heard it's good. (laughs) I know, now you got to check it out. S'mores and more after the service in the carport. Also, if we could have just like five strapping young or old men or women, and basically we'll take anyone, um, just to help set up for Together Nights. Talk to Jerry Cole. He's right there. It'll be great. All right, I love you guys. I'll see you next week. God bless.